the, this session, the morning session, I will be the chair and I am Sadiq Rangwala from the Raman Research Institute. Without further ado, let me just introduce the first speaker, which is who is Sven Heinemeyer from University of Madrid. And he will be talking about physics case for lepton colliders. Thanks a lot. Good morning, everybody. Yeah, this little cartoon shows already nearly everything that we have to know. We'll come back to this later. Physics case for lepton colliders, and in the program it said explicitly including mu plus or minus colliders, and we'll see about that. So I'll give you first some introduction, talk about Higgs measurements of the Higgs at 1 and 25 GV. I'll talk about BSM Higgses and some other BSM physics that may be relevant. And of course, as requested by the organizers, some words on the muon collider as well. Let's get started. Uh, I start here from the European point of view, and this is the some words from the European Strategy for Particle Physics update, and there is a very clear recommendation. The next large facility after the high luminosity LHC for particle physics should be in a plus or minus collider. And if the European uh, Strategy for Particle Physics says this, there's hardly any doubt that this should really be the case. Why do they want this? To study the Higgs at 125 GV? to do top electric physics and to do BSM searches Higgs and non-Higgs related. Yeah. Of course, we all know the LHC is working, the high luminosity LHC will come and the new plus and minus collider will certainly come after or at best in the end phase of the high luminosity LHC. Yeah. So the physics potential of new lepton colliders or I first concentrate on the plus and minus colliders as said here, must be viewed in the context of the high lumi LHC expectations and therefore, they're often shown in comparison with each other. I think this makes a lot of sense. Now, <clears throat> this is just a short overview about all the possibilities. I know that there are many talks dedicated here to several of these. I just give you this as an overview where we are and what will be the focus here. Of course, we have the Large Hadron Collider. The High Luminosity HC will come. It's approved. People are thinking about a high energy LHC in the same tunnel using new magnets. The question is, uh, will the magnets be ready or even possible? And then there are the various proposals for plus and minus colliders, the IRC possibly in Japan. Uh, sometimes I wrote here 2019, 2020, 2021. I just put an X here because of the delay. Uh, they will start, this would start at 250 GV, would go up to 1000 GV. There's the compact linear collider, uh, which would be at CERN, starting at 380 GV, going up to 3000 GV, the highest for senior plus or minus energy of all the proposals. Then come the circular machines, FCC EE, also at CERN, where the feasibility study is uh, on the way. And here the collisions would go up to 350 GV. The CPC, the circular plus or minus collider to be built in China, uh, three, 250 G may be also going up to 350 G. I think the official proposal still talks about 250 G V. And the new kit on the block here is the uh, C cube, the cool copper collider, which was discussed recently in the snow mass activities, for example, which could be constructed at Fermilab. If I got it right, they would go up to 600 G and even a 2 TV uh, uh, option is discussed. Going back to Hadron colliders in the very far future, there may be the FCC HH going up to 1000 TV. This possible is the same as here because it relies on the same type of magnets. And then of course, there's also the mu plus and minus colliders, which will be covered in the last part of my talk. So I will be focusing mostly of these here. Often I'll draw results from ILC or FCCE, which are abundantly available in the literature. Whereas uh, for example, C cubed has only very preliminary results so far. Now, we all know that uh, there was a discovery in 2012. You all know these plots. And we also know that the discovery that we have is a very standard model-like discovery. Everything or the measurements are in agreement with the standard model. On the other hand, uh, we also know that the standard model cannot be our ultimate theory. Yeah, gravity is not there, hierarchy problem, no unification of the forces. Dark matter is not included, the barrenness symmetry of the universe cannot be explained. Neutrino masses are not included. And there are some experimental data which are not in agreement with the standard model prediction. And I'll come back to, for example, the anomalous magnetic moment of the muon, which is just an example of this kind of uh, anomalies that are around nowadays. 
combining the two facts, there's only one possible conclusion, and this will be the base of uh, large parts of my talk. The standard model of the Higgs that has been discovered cannot be the standard model Higgs boson, yeah? because we know the standard model can't be the ultimate theory, can't be the standard model Higgs boson. However, this is not the real question I want to ask. The real question is, does the BSM physics that necessarily exists has any relevant impact on the Higgs? Are there maybe any hints from LHC results, at least as guidance or as toy examples in order to uh, do some interpretation of this work or to have an idea how future directions might be going? Not necessarily take them as true, but just as an inspiration of what can be, uh, what can be analyzed right now. And if so, uh, so if there's any BSM physics relevant, which model might this be? Now, in order to answer this, there are three possible obvious ways to answer it. We have to check for the changed properties of this, what I now often call H125, not to call it standard model Higgs. Of course, we also have to check for additional Higgs bosons above, but also below 125 GV. And necessarily check for other BSM physics related to the standard model problems. Yeah, this will be the way how to go ahead. The main questions that uh, we have and that a future plus or minus collider can contribute to, what are the couplings of this particle? Are the couplings proportional uh, to the mass of the particle as required by the brout angler higgs mechanism? What are the mass total width spin and CP properties uh, of this particle? Is there a CP violation? What are the self couplings? Can we reconstruct this, uh, the Higgs potential? Is this particle a single fundamental scalar as predicted by the stellar model, or maybe has it a larger structure? Is it part of a model with additional scalar singlets, doublets, or <laughs> dot, dot, dot should be here? <laughs> Little slash is missing. <laughs> Or could it be a composite state, yeah, bound by new interactions? Does this particle couple to new particles with no other couplings to the standard model, these so-called Higgs portal models? Is the particle mixed with any new scale of exotic origin, radians, extra dimension models, et cetera? Yeah? This is a plethora of questions that are related to the fact that the Higgs can't be the standard model Higgs and that we need DSM physics for the reasons that I've talked to you about. And this will be key for the analysis of the potential of the plus and minus colliders. Now, let's start with the Higgs at 125 GV. And uh, I have here a plot that shows as a center of the function of mass energy, the production cross section. Uh, the uh, red line, the largest one here, is the uh, Higgs Strahlung process indicated by this diagram at the tree level. And then at blue rising is the weak boson fusion. And the green slightly rising is the weak boson fusion with the Z bosons here, and then the total cross-section. And one can observe that the uh, total cross-section, but in particular the ZH cross-section, has a peak at 240, 250 GV. If you remember, when I discussed the various options of the plus and minus colliders, they're all more or less supposed to start at 250 GV, except maybe click that would start somewhat higher. But having them at 250 GV, the energy that can most easily be reached in this kind of setup is perfect to have a Higgs factory via this production mechanism, but also having then at slightly higher energies, the weak boson fusion kicking in, which can be relevant for some measurements. It's well known, we have this uh, very nice measurement of the, the model independent measurement of the cross section via this recall method, where we just observe the recall peak, which also gives us in, uh, well, which is crucial for a model independent coupling measurement, something that the LHC or any proton proton machine would not give us. And on top of it, it also provides, already this measurement provides the measurement of the mass better than 50 MeV. Now, uh, which mass measurement do we want? This is always the question, what can we measure and what do we want? And do we need this kind of collider? If one looks at the mass alone, first of all, the Higgs mass is a fundamental parameter and uh, deserves a high precision measurement on its own right, but from a, uh, physics precision point of view, the Higgs mass is an input parameter for Higgs physics. And for example, the uncertainty uh, where we, well, we are now maybe a little bit better than uh, 200 MeV, uh, this induces an uncertainty in the branching ratios uh, for the Z bosons or the W bosons at the level of two to two and a half percent. We want to measure this at the percent level at, le at, at least, and therefore a strong improvement here would be desirable just 
as for this one very one physics example that I've shown to you here. This is an overview about the various collider options for the uh, precision measurements for the Higgs boson couplings. Uh, maybe a bit busy, but I'll throw, slowly walk you through if you don't remember this plot. Um, these uh, kappas are the coupling strength modifiers in a simplified uh, framework of the Higgs boson to the standard model particles. So kappa W is the coupling uh, relative to the standard model of the Higgs to WW. Then this uh, gray bar is always the expectation of the high Lumi LHC. And here you can see there is some theory assumption in there in order to make this uh, plot possible. So at a, at a PP collider, you can't do it without any uh, additional theoretical input. So gray is the bar that we will get anyway. Yeah. And well, the, these numbers will change from, from plot to plot, but the gray bar is nearly always the basis filling it up. Yeah? And then one can see the, um, for example, the ILC measurements would be the green ones going from the light one, the 250 GV, then going up to higher center of mass energy, the darker ones. Uh, similarly, for uh, click, the light one, and then going to higher energies, the darker ones, CPC is only one bar, and FCC starts, FCC E at 240, then adding measurements at uh, 365. And then the last one, the best one, combining with FCC HH. And one can see that the plus and minus collider very roughly have similar results. Yeah, I don't think there's a really fundamental uh, difference in, in their precisions. Of course, the FCC HHHEE appears better, but it also includes then the very far future measurements of a uh, proton proton collider at 100 TV. And also, there are different theory assumptions included for this kind of measurements. Also, one always should remember the time scale. If you say, ah, we want FCC, we want this uh, dark blue bar, very good. I'm also in favor of it, but we will all be dead when this measurement will be there. Yeah, so we have to keep this in mind. What are the required precisions um, in order to get to BSM physics? I give you just two examples, one Susie example, one composite Higgs example. Couplings to gauge bosons will deviate from one at in the sub percent level, depending on the new uh, energy. And also for composite Higgs, depending on this composite scale, this will be in the percent range. Couplings to fermions uh, can, in this kind of the 2x doublet model uh, type 2 example, uh, can differ by several percent, but that are then suppressed strongly again with this new physics scale and also by this parameter 10 beta that we will come back to in a moment. Whereas couplings to bottom quarks and tau leptons, they usually show the largest deviation. They don't have this additional uh, suppression factor here. And similarly for composite Higgs, couplings to fermions are expected uh, in the percent range. So take home message, couplings to bosons are needed probably in the per mil range, couplings to fermions in the percent range, and only plus and minus colliders can yield this precision. I think I'll skip this for sake of time and um, ask the question, what can we learn? By the way, this is, of course, a very famous BSM Higgs sector represented here. So let's assume that we do see deviation in these measurements. What can we learn from that? And this is the so-called Higgs inverse problem. And people were very worried or maybe are very worried that we will not be able to disentangle it once we see deviation, which model can be behind. There's a very one simple solution to the Higgs inverse problem. I can assure you, once a deviation in the Higgs coupling is established experimentally, the next day on the archive, there will be all the theory models explaining this in all the glory detail. Yeah, so this we will have. But let's try to take a look at this already now. And uh, I give you just a summary of this. And I have a lot of what we call Wäscheline line plots in the backup where we can disentangle the various models from each other. But I have here only one summary for that. Uh, this is taken from uh, the ILC 250, where they compared one parameter point for various models that you can see here, like, uh, well, of course, standard model, uh, the MSSM, various other two X doublet models, composite Higgs, um, little Higgs models, radion, and Higgs singlet extension. And you not only want to disentangle the standard model like Higgs from a BSM Higgs, you also want to disentangle the various BSM results from each other. And they assumed here, as I said, 250 GV center of mass energy, two inverse autobahn. And well, they did this EFT analysis. 
And the numbers tell you how many sigmas each model is can be distinguished from the other. So this one from this one, eight sigma or so. Green is good, orange is not so good, red is bad. Meaning, well, we can do quite well already at 250 G with this uh, uh, assumed luminosity, but you can do even better if one adds the uh, measurements that are foreseen at 350 with a low luminosity. This is for the TT uh, threshold, plus the measurements at 500 GV. Then you can see nearly everything is green. Uh, if it's orange, you are very close to five sigma. And th this one combination is the only one that stays at 3.6. So this shows in general that in a plus or minus machine with sufficient luminosity can disentangle not only BSM Higgs sectors from the standard model, but also BSM Higgs sectors from each other. Of course, this analysis was done for a specific model point. You can play around. But in principle, this shows the uh, possibilities that such a collider offers us. So I think there's a very good, it's a very good reason for such a machine. Another example to highlight what the in the plus and minus machine can do with respect to the high luminosity LHC. This is one concrete example where we assumed a certain supersymmetric uh, scenario. I will not go into details. We fixed all the parameters and assumed that uh, the mass of the new Higgs bosons is at one TV and 10 beta, the ratio of the two vacuum expectation values is located at three. So the star is the model point assumed. And then we looked at the Higgs precision measurements that the various colliders could do and how this constrains this parameter space. The light pink area is the one where only high luminosity LHC projections are taken into account. And uh, you can see, well, in 10 beta, you, you get some range, but for the new physics scale, I can tell you this doesn't close. Yeah, this continues here. However, if you go to a plus and minus machine, and again, we took here the ILC 250 and 500 measurements as an example, but this holds for other plus and minus colliders equally, you get an upper limit on the new physics scale. Yeah, here at the case of about two TeV. This means the plus and minus machines can set upper limits on BSM Higgs scales, and this can set a clear target for other future collider searches. Yeah, this can likely not be done, uh, can easily escape the high luminosity LHC, where as at in the plus and minus machine, this likely can be done that you can set this kind of upper limit here. The holy grail, as it's often called in particle physics, the Higgs boson self coupling. I just for now, I give you just one uh, overview plot here. We want to measure the trilinear Higgs coupling. And the color coding nicely is exactly the same as in the kappa plot that I've shown to you before. The uh, circular machines like CPC and FCCE have the problem that they can't go to the de Higgs production. Uh, they go up to 350, maybe 360, 65 GV. But for the Higgs production, you need more than 500 GV. So here, only some indirect uh, EFT distribution can be done, and then you're stuck at the level of about 50%. These are these light shaded bars. The darker bars, they include direct uh, dihex production. And again, you can see that you end up depending on the center of mass energy at a precision of 20 or something like 10%. Yeah, here, for example, click at high energies can go up to 10%. One word of caution, and I'll come back to this later. These extrapolations, they always assume that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling has the value as predicted in the standard model. However, this value has certain drawbacks, as I will show to you later, and this uh, can have severe consequences for the precision with which a future collider can determine the trilinear Higgs coupling. So here always kappa lambda is the true value of the Higgs coupling divided by the standard model prediction. Yeah? And here all these uh, determinations assume that this kappa lambda is equal to one. Now, there's one extrapolation, uh, which we did, or uh, which was done here by, by Jenny List from Hamburg. Uh, she went from minus 0.5 to about 2 in this uh, kappa lambda, yeah, the true value divided by the standard model value. The dark lines show you what can be expected at the high luminosity LHC. Yeah, this was this uh, fifth one. This is the 50% measurement that can be expected at the high luminosity LHC. And you can see that it becomes a bit better if we go to smaller values. This is because of the interference of signal and background, which uh, increases the cross-section once uh, this coupling becomes smaller for the high luminosity LHC. But for larger values, this becomes worse. On the other hand, the, here are the numbers for the ILC 500 in green, which are better here, become very good here, but here become very bad. Now here, 
the interference works in the other way because there are different diagrams contributing and the determination deteriorates completely. However, adding the one TV data with the new new Higgs Higgs uh, final state goes on the other way, again, a different interference pattern, and the ILC can maintain its high precision and here also become very, very precise in this for, very, for the larger values. Now, um, I told you one important failure of the standard model is the barrier symmetry of the universe. And what you need, or one very possible, one, one popular mechanism, let's say, is uh, having a first order phase transition in the early universe when the, uh, when the universe goes to its true vacuum state. And um, this can happen. And I give you just one example here. Uh, so you get a first order electric phase transition for the baroness symmetry of the universe, which can also give you gravitational waves that can be detected by uh, LISA, for example, or possibly by some um, atomic interferometers. And the last talk today, I think, will touch upon this, Oliver, right? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Now, what you find when you look in this kind of examples, that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling doesn't have the standard model value. With the standard model, it doesn't work. You don't get a first order phase transition. You don't get the baroness symmetry, which was one of the failures. And usually what you find is that the value of the trilinear Higgs coupling is more at the range of two rather than one. Now, if you remember this plot here, you see, the LHC becomes worse, E plus and minus becomes better. And this is reflected here. I show you, well, this is the signal over noise ratio expected at LISA. This is the kappa lambda value. And the color coding tells you the precision that can be acquired at the high luminosity LHC. You can see here you're only in the 70, 72% range. So a very bad determination. Whereas the determination at the ILC 500 only is now at the 10% range. Before it was 20, but at the value that may be favored by Byron assumption of the universe, you get a 10% determination. Again, it, this shows how superior I plus or minus colliders with respect to the high luminosity LHC. You can also look at exotic Higgs decays. I'll not go into details here. Of course, new physics would imply changes in exotic Higgs decays. There's a plethora of uh, final states. Again, the color coding as before, uh, the various E plus and minus colliders, gray is high luminosity LHC. Again, strong improvement. I'll not go into details what this may imply for one or the other model, but also here, of course, E plus and minus can be much better than uh, PP. Another important point, the Higgs consistency test via electric precision observables. What is the general idea? Well, one takes precisely measured data, W was on mass, effective weak mixing angle, et cetera. And you compare this with your favorite theory prediction, which can be standard model, SUSY, or whatever model you like here. And then via these virtual contributions to this standard model process, via these virtual contributions, you can get access to unknown mass scales. This was the way the Higgs boson mass was predicted within the framework of the standard model before its discovery. But you can also predict the BSM mass scales this way. Of course, you need very high accuracy in the measurement as well as in the theory prediction. And there are only very few models that may be ready in order to play this game, which is, of course, the standard model, which is also the MSSM and probably pure multi-Higgs models, because that's particularly simple to do this kind of calculation. The last time this was done for electric precision data in order to confront the standard model with uh, the direct measurement, with the indirect measurement, this is already a couple of years old from the GFITTER group. And one can see this was all the data taken into account, gives you an indirect precision of 90 plus minus roughly 20 GV in agreement in quotation marks at the 1.8 sigma level. Although there was a slight rising tension over the years, uh, of course, not taken into account is the recent measurement of the W with mass by CDF, which I will not discuss here. This would be a talk on its own right which would increase this tension to something like seven sigma. Now, all this precision data will improve with the plus and minus machines. Either uh, here, I took the numbers ILC Giga Z, much more, much better, of course, if one goes to FCCE with the Terra Z option, because just many more Z bosons are produced. I only give here the values for the effective free X angle or the W boson mass, and of course, the top quark mass, which is determined from a top threshold scan. A strong improvement can be seen. These numbers do not include theory uncertainties. I will not discuss them here. But 
well, the evaluation that you can do for this, well, we had here this uh, parabola with the current data, and you can ask the question, how will this parabola improve with future data? And the only evaluation that has been done use these numbers. You can imagine using these numbers, the parabolas will become even steeper. But using only this kind of numbers, this was done by two groups, uh, you get this uh, plot here. This is the old parabola, and this would be the new parabola. Yeah, this is the Jupiter group. This was the electro lab electric working group when this was done. Yeah, this is this famous blue band that you all know, and then this is the future. And you get an indirect determination at the level of 6 GV or better. And this will be an extremely sensitive test of the standard model and, of course, also of VSM extensions of it. Yeah? And you can see that even if the current, well, this was here, the current value was 94 GV when this was done, but it would be incompatible at the five sigma level with 125 GV measurement of the Higgs boson. And again, this does not take into account the recent W boson mass measurement of CDF. So again, the plus and minus gives you also for the acquisition data a strong improvement that can be important in the future. BSM Higgses. Well, we, I was talking a little bit about uh, the sensitivity of the, about the indirect sensitivity to BSM Higgses, but now let's see what the plus and minus colliders can do in the direct searches for BSM Higgs bosons. There are many, many models around, singlet editions, doublet models and all its types, SUSE models, uh, SUSE models with singlets, you can add triplets. And as I was saying before, you can also have BSM models without extended Higgs sectors where you can look for these changed properties, but this was covered in the previous part of my talk. Yeah? But there's a plethora of models that uh, naturally give you BSM Higgs bosons. And uh, I'll start with the BSM Higgs bosons above 125 GV. And again, one has to take into account what the high luminosity LHC can give us. This is the plane of the new Higgs boson mass scale, MA versus, again, this factor of 10 beta. This is an old limit now. We are somewhat better. But the blue and the red lines show the projections in this plane, what the high luminosity LHC will be capable of doing. And they can exclude all this parameter space here up above this, uh, these lines. Now, how does it look at the plus and minus? There are two ways to produce heavy Higgs bosons looking at this Higgs Strahlung process. You can either <coughs> produce a heavy Higgs again with the Z boson. And this is a 2X doublet model uh, type uh, situation. It's concretely the MSM, but in the 2X doublet model, it looks exactly the same where one has the suppression factors with respect to the standard model, either the sine squared beta minus alpha or cosine squared beta minus alpha, where the heavy Higgs always goes with the cosine squared. You can also produce two Higgs bosons together, uh, a CP odd one and a CP even one. Uh, and in this case, it goes with the sine squared. Now the measurements of the Higgs properties tell us that the sine squared is probably close to one, and then the cosine necessarily is close to zero meaning you can produce the heavy Higgs bosons not singly, but only in pairs. This is a very common feature on all this kind of models. You can't produce one heavy state, but only two heavy states. And by looking at some other restrictions, this tells you that very roughly the reach of an plus or minus collider is about half the center of mass energy. Yeah, you can only pair produce them and the masses are similar. Very simple. This is one evaluation of click where they analyzed how far they can go in this new mass scale, assuming, for example, here 3 TV, you would expect 1.5 TV and they go up to 1.4. So nearly the kinematic limit, exactly as I was telling you before. Very nice. Translating this into the previous plot in very simple terms, even if you go to the ILC 1000, mm, this will not tell you very much about the heavy Higgs bosons here, of course. Yeah, You have to go to substantially higher energies. If you can go to this kind of energy, a lot of parameter space can be covered. This may look small, but uh, well, I think it's a substantial and important part of this uncovered parameter space. So there are some unique opportunities if you're able to go to high energies. There's one more example. You can even go beyond this limit by having this kind of production here, depending on what you assume for this uh, sine beta minus alpha. This shows you the, uh, well, this looks at the decay of the new Higgs boson to two gauge bosons. This is the invariant mass spectrum of this decay. And if the, well, here it was assumed the set of mass energy one TV and the Higgs mass four energy V, you see a clear peak, but you're still below the threshold. This assumes a mass of 600 GV, and you can still see a peak here. Yeah? And I'm sure if this kind of situation was realized, much more 
analysis or much more uh, person power would go into it and one could try to work out this peak even above this half percent of mass energy threshold just to show an example five minutes okay this means i was talking too much to you good thanks let's see where we can get let's come to one of my favorite topics the higgs bosons below 125 gv and in this plot one can see the mass scale versus the effective coupling to z bosons squared this is what was excluded by lab and again the plus and minus depending on the setup can cover either this parameter space above the orange or uh, above the red line so large part of this parameter space for a very reduced coupling which would be something like this uh, um, cosine squared beta minus alpha or so can be covered by any plus the minus machine now let's take one well i come to this in a moment how could one see such Higgs boson for example again via this uh, uh, recoil with a z boson uh, where the higgs can decay to anything uh, and the green is the background this is the z this is the standard model uh, the 125 Higgs boson this recoil but depending on the energy that you assume for your new higgs boson you can see a very nice recoil peak yeah so again such higgs boson ideal for any plus and minus machine that is on the market right now my favorite example is always uh, based on some experimental data where there was an axis seen by cms in the search here pp goes to higgs to photon photon at 95 gv uh, i don't think i have time to walk you through but they have a three sigma axis here which is uh, not uh, excluded not even touched by the atlas measurements and we are waiting for new, new data there. So this is the channel at the BP collider. And uh, if you remember lab, there was also an excess at the same mass in the BB final state. Yeah? So there are three, there are two different final states that uh, tell that there might be a Higgs in, in this mass range here, either at the two or the three sigma level. And if one wants to investigate this, we try to do this. We took the two X tablet model, added another Higgs singlet, and uh, analyze whether first can this uh, explain the axis b what can a plus and minus machine do in this case yeah so this is a very nice toy example for a light exposon and we analyzed uh, what kind of measurements can be done and what we see here well here this is the signal strength measured at cms this is signal strength strength measured at lab all the colored points are prediction by our model this is the one sigma ellipse and you can see uh, this model can easily explain the two axes. So this works either in the 2x doublet model type 2 or 2x doublet model type 4. Uh, and this would be the one that is predicted by supersymmetry, for example. Now, this works, so this kind of model can do it. Um, can we produce the new Higgs boson at any plus and minus machine? This is again the lab exclusion limit this was the expected one this was the axis that lab has seen and these parameter points are predicted by the model this is the line above we can see everything so really we can produce this expose on easily and probably study it in detail we can do two types of coupling measurements we can study the couplings of the 125 here the coupling to tau plus tau minus versus uh, zz standard model prediction high luminosity LHC measurements, uh, ILC 250 measurements, but any plus and minus collider could do this uh, green ellipse here. These are the two parameter spaces, Twix double model type two, Twix double model type four. You can see there's a large deviation, meaning with the uh, E plus and minus precision, you can either exclude this model or if this green ellipse, which is now centered at the standard model point, would be centered at one of these points, would this clearly exclude the standard model and possibly tell you, depending where you are, which of the two types is favored. But you can do more. As I told you, you can produce the new Higgs boson and then do a coupling determination of the new Higgs boson. And we did also this exercise. Uh, again, coupling of the light Higgs boson to tau plus tau minus versus coupling to uh, ZZ. Type two, type four, clearly distinguished. Furthermore, you can see these little green ellipses these would be the precisions that one can expect for the coupling determination. This would really help you to pin down where you are in the parameter space, yeah, via measurement of this Higgs boson at E plus, E minus. Good. I don't have much time, I know. Uh, I wanted to say a few words on BSM physics. I will probably skip most of it, but will make you aware of a few facts and uh, tell you what E plus, E minus can do. 
Uh, of course, indirect evidence is nice. Maybe even light Higgs bosons can be seen, but can we really see other new particles? Yeah, and at the plus at PP colliders, we have higher energy, higher reach for colored particles, but there are uh, difficult regions like compressed spectra. The plus and minus, on the other hand, lower energies, easier reach for uncolored particles, and difficult regions can be covered much easier. But potentially or particularly compressed spectra. Yeah? And then there's a question, do we have maybe hints for the mass scales that we can expect here? Just to show you, compressed spectra, is this something, yes, is this something very special or not? Two different analyses, uh, one in SUSY well, uh, with low mu and the global fit tells you compressed spectra are something very normal. Now I can tell you, since I don't have time, compressed spectra for the light Suzy particles are particularly difficult for the LHC. Yeah, it has problems to see compressed spectra, whereas for a plus and minus, this can be done very easily. And I'll skip this and come to one final plot. This one here. Yeah. Here we did an analysis taking into account measurements from G minus two, dark matter measurements, etc., for various Suzy scenarios where we can have compressed spectra. This is the mass of the second lightest particle, and this is the mass gap. Um, these lines here show you the reach of the Hailumi LHC for various analyses, whereas the vertical lines tell you how far any plus and minus collider can go. And for the three scenarios that are given here, you can see they could all escape high luminosity LHC measurements, whereas they can be covered at least, well, with this latest, but also here, this is the ILC 1000. Practically everything can be covered. All small mass gaps uh, should be coverable. And there's much more on this in the backup. So again, a clear superior possibility for a plus and minus machines. With this, I skip the cross sections and uh, come to my conclusions. Ah, sorry, I forgot. Some words on the muon collider. I, I uh, well, Forgive me. Uh, I took here some sentences from the Muon Collider Forum report. Muon Colliders being circular and compact provide a unique combination of energy precision and high luminosity. Thus, they are distinctively attractive option. This has two key advantages which are normally competing in usual electron and proton-based colliders. Equivalent high energy collisions reached in a compact setting and a cleaner non-QCD dominated environment to undertake precision, uh, physics studies in it. And my take, this is all correct, and I would love to have any plus, a mu plus and minus collider. From a physics and maturity point of view, I think a uh, mu plus and minus collider should come after the E plus and minus collider. And if you really want to hear about my favorite one, which is the NLSP collider, you have to ask me over coffee. But of course, mu plus and minus, there are examples where they can do very well. This is Higgs precision measurements. This is um, the measurements of the trilinear coupling, uh, which can be good and better at FC, the, better than FCCHH, and also reach for new physics because high energies can be reached. Yeah, you can see here new physics, depending on the scenario in the multi-TV range can be covered. Yeah, And so muon colliders are great, and I would love to have them, but for me, they are the next step after A plus and minus. And with this, I conclude. These are my conclusions, very short. Uh, so. Let's build in the plus and minus collider and of course the muon collider afterwards. Thanks a lot. Hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. You uh, talked elaborately on the Higgs uh, couplings details and things like that. Um, what about the other couplings, like for example, the gauge couplings and then the top quark, for example? Uh, of course, 250 may be difficult, but higher energy. Yes, you are uh, absolutely right. I skipped this because well, I couldn't uh, put more into it. You're absolutely right. Also, these couplings, of course, can be determined with a much better precision at the plus and minus collider. Here, if I remember correctly, also higher energies are advantageous for the couplings to top quarks. Yeah, you can measure them already at the threshold, but much better once you go to 450, 500 GV cent of mass energy. And then they can determine very, very precisely. And if people are doing now these global fits in an EFT framework, they're including all this into the fit. And one can see how also from this side, the fit improves substantially by including the plus and minus precision. Yeah, this is a very important ingredient. I fully agree. 
from this point of view, I only covered the measurements for the electric precision observables, but you're absolutely right. Couplings to gauge bosons and particularly top quarks and bottom quarks are a crucial ingredient and they are much better at the plus and minus machines. Yeah. And how about the dark matter uh, searches? <laughs> dark matter searches, always depending on the scenario. I, I think there it's, it's a bit too vague. You have to really go into the scenario. We did this evaluation only for the MSSM. And uh, well, maybe I can go back a few slides here. Um, uh, yeah, in this kind of scenarios, you can also look for the production. Uh, I think this is, sorry, this is in the backup. We looked at the production of dark matter particles. Um, uh, I, I will not get there. Uh, we looked, because this is very slow, at the production of dark matter particles. And this can be done very nicely at the plus and minus machines, but this is going so slow that I will not get there. No, sorry. Yeah, Take a look at the talk and uh, there, are, there are many examples. How also the dark matter particles can be produced and the, well, this is not in the backup, but also the, the couplings can be measured. And the question is whether you can then reconstruct the dark matter density. And also there it was shown that with the plus and minus precision, this may be possible, whereas with PP precision, this may not be possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Right, uh, there's a question there. Ah, yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so yeah, I was just curious that uh, for heavy Higgs searches, now mm -hmm. in the lepton collider, the coupling will be mainly rely on the electroweak coupling. Yes. But if let's say the model choose to be in the alignment limit, then the product producing heavy X will be difficult because we don't <laughs> have any other thing, right? Well, then you have to produce them in pairs. Yeah, yeah. The pair production is of course a possibility. Yeah. Then you are limited by the subset of mass energy, but this was exactly the point. Yeah, and the alignment limit gives you a large pair production cross section, but single production goes to zero exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. and another correct. thing is like, am I curious? So why ILC can put a upper bound on the new physics, but HLLC cannot? Can you this little? <laughs> well, <laughs> let me see whether I'm, I'm sorry that this is so slow. I have one plot on this. Yeah, in the beginning, actually. No, I, the real plot is in the backup. It's something like this one here. Yeah, this was the scenario that I was showing to you. Uh, for MA1000, 10 beta 3. Uh, let's say, let's take the, this one here. This is the one that I was showing. Okay, doesn't matter. It's more or less what I wanted to show you. Um, the high luminosity LHC precision is shown as red bar, and then the e plus and minus in green or blue bars. The orange horizontal bar is the theory prediction. And you can see that the high luminous LHC uh, precision is just not good enough. Yeah, you can't say anything anymore. And then this improved precision at the plus and minus is good enough to set this upper limit. This is an indirect fit. Yeah, if the mass scale was smaller, 700 GV, then also high luminosity LHC could still do it. So it all depends where the heavy Higgs boson mass scale is located. Yeah. So uh, with that, let's thank uh, Sven.